1849, a whaling ship called the Amazon put ashore in Tahiti. It had been built in Aparima, Riverton, and was captained by 40-year-old Englishman John Howell. Howell had run away to sea when he was 12 and had been operating out of Aotearoa and Australia for half his life. His ship was mostly crewed by his Māori in-laws. Howell had married two Māori women, first Kohihohi of Ngāti Māmui and then after her death, Kurunaki of Ngaitahu. Howell and his crew found Tahiti in an uproar. Gold had been discovered across the Pacific in California and the locals asked desperately if they'd take them to San Francisco to join the gold rush. At first, Howell wasn't all that interested. He wanted to go back home. But his Ngāti Māmoi and Naitahu rallies talked him round. They were keen to see the wider world and find out why people were so excited about California. So the Amazon sailed off. When they arrived, Captain Howell and his Māori in-laws joined in with the frantic diggers. And one day, as they washed the gravel through their pan, there it was. Gold. John Howell was speechless. But his relatives just shrugged. They asked why they had sailed thousands of miles to find gold in California when the same stuff could be found in the rivers back home in Aotearoa. John Howell asked his relatives where to find this gold, but they refused to tell him. Maybe they were worried about bringing home the chaos they'd seen in California. But within 12 years, the secret was out, and one of the world's most significant gold rushes began right here in Aotearoa. Kia ora, I'm William Ray. Kia ora, I'm Marnie Dunlop. Welcome to the Aotearoa History Show. There are three main ingredients you need for a gold rush. Geology, culture and capitalism. First, geology, because you can't have a gold rush without gold. Gold mostly exists as tiny specks of metal locked up inside quartz rock. To extract that gold, you usually need expensive, heavy equipment. But in a handful of special places, nature does a lot of the work for us. Over thousands of years, quartz gets broken down by wind and rain and washed into rivers. The rivers jumble the rocks around and those gold specks become bigger flakes and nuggets that settle on the riverbed, just waiting for someone to pick them up. In 1852, a Ngāti Māmui Ngaitahu chief called Rakiraki told Pākehā gold seekers that he once picked up a nugget the size of a potato from a local river and he chucked it straight back in the water. That's because the second ingredient you need for a gold rush is a culture that values gold, and Māori didn't. Our precious mineral was, and still is, Honamu, greenstone. So there weren't any gold rushes in Aotearoa until Europeans turned up, because there's no practical use for it. And actually, there weren't really gold rushes anywhere in the world until the 19th century. That's because the final ingredient you need for a proper gold rush is capitalism. For most of world history, gold mining was controlled by powerful aristocrats. The people who did the actual digging were usually slaves or indentured labourers. But with the rise of capitalism, it became possible for ordinary people to mine and sell gold themselves, provided they had the resources, the capital, to get it. The place where all these ingredients came together for the first time was the United States in 1848. When gold was discovered in the rivers of California, it was promoted by none other than US President James Polk in an address to Congress. The accounts of the abundance of gold in that territory are of such an extraordinary character as would scarcely command belief were they not corroborated by the authentic reports of officers in the public service. What happened next sets the template for pretty much every other gold rush of the 19th century, including Aotearoa. Gold rushes were chaotic. Thousands of people headed into the wilderness, often without any experience in mining or even surviving the outdoors. Without police or courts, diggers came up with their own rough and ready rules that became known as digger law. The bonds between diggers could be extremely strong, but they could be vicious to those they saw as outsiders, like local Native American tribes and Chinese diggers. The next big gold rush after California was in Victoria, Australia. Authorities tried to clamp down on the chaos there by using heavy taxes and strict policing. But that sparked fierce resistance, including the famous Eureka Rebellion, where at least 27 people were killed. 
Despite the chaos, gold fever quickly spread to Aotearoa. Poor colonists and more than a few Māori saw a chance for wealth and flooded over to Australia and California. Others started wondering what lay beneath the ground here. But when the first small gold discoveries were announced in New Zealand during the 1850s, not everyone was delighted. Some rangatira opposed gold mining. They worried the discovery of gold in Aotearoa would only increase Pākehā hunger for Māori land. And they had an unlikely ally, rich Pākehā landowners, especially the big sheep farmers known as wool lords or sheep barons. Now, you might be thinking, wouldn't the sheep barons just get richer if gold was found on their land? Well, the thing is, under British law, gold is a royal metal. No matter where you find it, it belongs to the crown. So the last thing the sheep barons wanted was their property seized by the government and turned into a gold field, and respectable colonists weren't keen on the sort of drunken riffraff they associated with gold digging. So they did their best to block the search for gold in New Zealand. For a while, the government went along with this. After all, many politicians in this era were sheep barons themselves. But the lure of gold was too much. Eventually, provincial governments stopped blocking prospectors and started offering rewards for the discovery of profitable gold fields. In June 1861, Gabriel Reed, a veteran of the Californian and Victorian gold fields, wrote a letter to a local official. It was later published in the Otago Witness. In this letter, it was like a starting gun being fired. The rush was on. I take the liberty of troubling you with a short report on the result of a gold prospecting tour. In one place, for 10 hours' work with pan and butcher's knife, I was enabled to collect about 7 ounces of gold. To put that in modern terms, Gabriel Reed dug up about $17,000 worth of gold in a single day. The spot where Gabriel was digging is just outside what's now the town of Lawrence in central Otago. It was given the name Gabriel's Gully. But it wasn't really discovered by Gabriel at all. The first person to find gold at this gully was a shepherd called Edward Peters. He's thought to have been from Mumbai and might have dug for gold in California before coming to Aotearoa. Gabriel Reed followed up on Peters' discovery and was the first to promote the field more widely. In any case, the Otago gold rush was on. Three weeks later, the Otago witness reported... Gold, gold, gold is the universal subject of conversation. The fever is running to such a height that, if it continue, there will be scarcely a man left in town. The rush quickly spread beyond Gabriel's gully, as gold was found in valleys and streams all over Otago and in Southland, Marlborough and on the west coast. Settlements sprung up, sometimes on or near pre-existing kainga Māori. Digger camps formed the foundations for towns which are still around today. Queenstown, Arrowtown, Cromwell, Westport, Greymouth, Wokitika, and the list goes on and on. People swarmed the South Island looking for gold. 19th century population stats are notoriously inaccurate, but what figures we do have suggest the Pākehā population of New Zealand more than doubled in 10 years, and many of those migrants came chasing gold. This was one of the biggest influxes of people in New Zealand history, and it solidified Aotearoa as a Pākehā-dominated country. Hundreds of Pākehā diggers would join the colonial militia to fight Māori in the New Zealand wars in exchange for promises of land. So... Who were the diggers? They weren't the poorest of the poor. Those in extreme poverty couldn't afford to get to the goldfields in the first place. But they weren't all that rich either. Adventuring upper-class men often tried digging, only to find they weren't cut out for the grinding labour. Most successful diggers were small farmers or sailors or skilled craftsmen like carpenters and masons, people with a bit of cash to get them started and who were used to working outdoors. Many seized gold digging as a chance to escape wage labour and work for themselves. And while they all hoped to strike it rich, most had realistic expectations. One traveller said this about the gold seekers in California. Some are young men from the country who are bound to the mines in hopes of gathering sufficient of the gold dust to enable them to return home and buy a farm. Others are broken down storekeepers or mechanics who find that there is little or no prospect of saving enough for a rainy day. Where did the first waves of diggers come from? All over the world, but mostly England, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Scandinavia, Scotland and the United States. Māori were extensively involved in Otago's rushes too. All the major Southern Ngaitahu chiefs took part. Some modern linguists think the distinct New Zealand accent and dialect first evolved from all of these cultures mixing on the goldfields. How old were the diggers? Most were very young, boys in their teens and young men in their twenties. They grew their hair and beards long and almost never washed. 
On the Otago goldfields, they dress like pirates in high boots, tight velvet trousers and loose shirts, often dyed red, pale yellow or blue. They accessorised with silk, sashes, gold rings and watch chains. Skarks. As the Otago witness explained, fashion was a way of signalling your success. You can tell the good claims from the general appearance of the men working them. They are well dressed, wearing their silken sashes and gold chains while at work. Diggers sang and shouted to each other as they worked, and when someone struck gold, they celebrated wildly. George Holmes said this about the moment his mate got a lucky find at Moke Creek near Queenstown. I thought he'd gone crazy. He seized the basin and ran round and round with it, pretty nigh delirious with joy. We'll never know how much gold was extracted by these boys and men. Official yields peaked in 1863 at almost 18,000 kilos. But gold was also smuggled out of the country secretly to avoid taxes. Digging wasn't all fun and games. It was hard work in brutal conditions. Knee-deep in freezing cold rivers, choking on dust and tormented by blood-sucking sand flies. Many diggers lost their lives, and a lot of it was down to really bad timing. In the summer of 1863, the rivers ran low, and diggers pitched tents close to the water. But in July, disaster struck. Here's how historian Stephen Eldred Grigg describes it. Cold cloudbursts drove down for six days. Shingle and mud crashed into the gorges and staunched rivers with rough rubble dams, behind which floodwaters began banking up quickly. Storms dumped still more downpours. Overnight, the dams burst. Waves like walls up to six metres from trough to crest came slamming down the valleys. A British digger called Bob was sleeping in his tent beside his friend Bill as the water came crashing down. I realised our situation at once and caught Bill by the shoulders and shook him. He only muttered something about Sister Mary. I felt the water rising on my legs. There was not a moment to lose. Bob dragged his mate out of bed and made a run for it, but when he looked behind, Bill had vanished. His body was later found 70 kilometres downriver. I thought of poor young Bill, so happy and merry, carried away by that horrid rapid river. I could not restrain my tears. Bill was one of maybe a hundred diggers killed by the floods in 1863. Hundreds more drowned in the years that followed. In fact, drowning was so common throughout early colonial New Zealand, it became known as the New Zealand Death. Many others lost fingers and toes to frostbite in winter. Some froze to death. Hastily dug pits and tunnels often collapsed, burying men alive. In such harsh conditions, the diggers clubbed together, living in small groups, usually two to seven men. The phrase at the time was that they went mates. And of course, Kiwis and Australians still call each other mates. Much of that tradition of close, blokey friendship was born on the goldfields. These sometimes became sexual relationships too. There were only a handful of female Pākehā diggers, most of them working alongside their husbands. But thousands more working women followed men out into the goldfields. As Stephen Eldred Grigg says, those women were looking for exactly the same thing as the men. Wealth and freedom. A woman on the goldfield could make very good money. Her scarcity value was so high during the first year or two that a slipshod, slatternly, stockingless, insolent servant woman, moaned a diggings newspaper, could pocket two to three pounds a week as wages besides her keep. Women filled all kinds of roles. Merchants, hotel keepers, washerwomen, sex workers. Young women were always in demand by pubs as dancers and barmaids to encourage the men to buy drinks. Like there was one popular song on the West Coast which went like this. Nancy smiles are quite beguiling to make some fun she's willing, oh. You give a rap, she turns the tap and thanks you for your shilling, oh. Nice work. <laughs> Life on the goldfields could be an exciting escape from the drudgery of factory work, domestic service or marriage. But just like gold digging, it was risky. Some women made money, but only a minority got rich from their shops, brothels and pubs. Same went for the men. Most diggers never found enough gold to make their fortune. Not that it stopped people looking. Gold was found at the top of the South Island in the mid-1850s, enough to earn the area the name Golden Bay, but not so much that it drew more than 2,000 miners. Quite a few of those diggers were Māori. They worked differently than Pākehā. Instead of growing mates in small groups of men, they often worked collectively as a whānau or hapū. The strongest shoveling, the nimble-fingered washing gravel through pans, and the rest cooking and cleaning back at camp. Resourceful. <laughs> 
Some Māori diggers worked their way south down the western coast, but the discovery that finally triggered the West Coast gold rush was down to a group of Māori who weren't looking for gold at all. In February 1864, four Māori were hunting for Pounamu along Pohonu Creek. Iwi ko te aika, i haia tainui, and iri hapiti pātahi of Ngaitahu, plus iri hapiti's husband, Haimona Tuako of Ngati Kahangunu. They found a large ponamu boulder, and when they lifted it up, the sand underneath was sparkling with gold. When news made it back to Otago, diggers flooded west. Many were drowned in shipwrecks on the rugged coastline or froze to death hiking through the southern Alps or starved to death when they ran out of supplies. But lots made it, and that sparked intense demand for Māori land near the site of the diggings. Pōtini Naitahu ended up losing a fair chunk of it to squatters and government agents. The boom on the west coast to Taipotini was also bad news for Otago. Gold had made the province insanely wealthy, supporting shopkeepers, craftsmen and hospitality workers. As the diggers went west, their customers vanished. But they were replaced with a new wave of diggers, many of them Chinese. Chinese diggers were encouraged in part by the Dunedin Chamber of Commerce, which asked Chinese merchants in Melbourne to help promote the Otago gold fields. The merchants agreed, but only so long as Chinese diggers were promised equal treatment under the law, protection from violence and not subjected to extra taxes. Chinese diggers were a huge part of the gold rush in California and Australia too. Most came from Guangdong province in southern China. They usually came from families that were neither rich nor very poor. Families and clans often pooled resources to send men to the gold fields on the condition they send a chunk of their winnings home to support the community. We don't know for sure how many came to Aotearoa, but at least 8,000 arrived in Otago, and thousands more went to the west coast. They were often very successful. Whereas Pākehā usually worked in groups of two to seven people, Chinese diggers operated in larger crews, typically 40 to 50 people. Many had experience working with water to irrigate farmland back home. They put this expertise to work on the gold fields, building dams, blasting away with water cannon and dredging on floating platforms. This allowed them to access gold which European diggers had assumed was too difficult to reach. One of their most ambitious projects was to divert a channel of the biggest river in the South Island, Mata'o, the Clutha, so they could mine the riverbed. Every year they piled up rocks to redirect its flow, and every year their efforts were destroyed by flooding. But to the astonishment of Pākehā witnesses, they kept at it, as one wrote. These Chinese diggers are above all plucky, and incapable either of admitting failure, bowing to difficulties, or sitting down to hard luck. They are above all things stickers and are besides very ingenious or resourceful in work of this kind. Chinese diggers sometimes spoke fondly of their experience in Aotearoa. One named A Teng told the Otago Daily Times, Plenty of Chinese people will come by and by. The country's much better than Victoria. And as another said, there was plenty wood, plenty fire, plenty tucker. But Chinese immigrants also copped plenty of abuse. They were often harangued in the street and occasionally assaulted by young thugs and sometimes by women in Māori too. Chinese people were also excluded from some colonial settlements. For example, they were forbidden from living in the town of Lawrence and had to set up camp on the outskirts. And the discrimination got worse over time. A prominent anti-Chinese politician was Richard Seddon, who became a local body politician towards the end of the gold rush in the 1870s and rose to become Prime Minister in 1893, our longest serving Prime Minister. Seddon set a lot of the groundwork for New Zealand's modern welfare state. He'd been a digger himself on the West Coast, and his working-class sympathies made him a champion of poorer Pākehā. But he also won supporters through vicious anti-Chinese speeches and policies. By the time Seddon made it to Parliament, gold was running thin and economic depression had hit. While some had welcomed Chinese miners as a boost to the economy, Many Pākehā now feared competition from Chinese people for jobs and business, especially as Chinese people left the goldfields to set up shops and market gardens. Unashamedly anti-Chinese groups such as the Anti-Chinese Association and the Anti-Asiatic League grew up. 
Many Pākehā oppose such prejudice, but in 1881, Parliament had the numbers to pass the Chinese Immigrants Act. It required Chinese migrants to pay a £10 poll tax, and ships could only carry one Chinese person per 10 tonnes of cargo. In 1896, those barriers were raised to one Chinese person per 200 tonnes and a £100 tax. That's $20,000 in today's money. More were soon added. Chinese alone were banned from becoming British citizens and required to pass English language tests before entering the country. These policies formed the bones of what became known as a white New Zealand policy. It was outlined bluntly by Prime Minister William Massey in 1921 when he spoke out against Chinese migration, saying, Nature intended New Zealand to be a white man's country, and it must be kept as such. I wonder what the Māori thought about that. (laughs) The Chinese poll tax was only removed in 1944, with Deputy Prime Minister Walter Nash calling it a blot on our legislation. The New Zealand government officially apologised for it in 2002. But stigma against Chinese people as outsiders is still a problem in Aotearoa. As Race Relations Commissioner Ming Foon wrote in 2020, despite being in Aotearoa for more than 150 years, Chinese continue to be racially profiled as perpetual migrants. The last major hunt for gold happened in Te Taraotika a Maui, the Coromandel Peninsula. Coromandel had been a focus for gold prospectors on and off since the 1850s, but the hype never really paid out. As one visitor from the West Coast wrote, There are some very good claims, but where there is one good claim, there are 50 that never see a speck. Frustrated diggers often assumed the next valley over must be full of gold, if only local Māori would let them look. But Marutuahu, the confederated tribes of Coromandel, were reluctant to open up more land to diggers. Even when individual Māori consented, the Wairahapu didn't always accept that decision. Like in early 1867, Mere Kuri Te Kati, Rangatira Ngati Tamate led about 20 other women to drive Pākehā surveyors out of Ohine Muri. She also threatened to throw the Māori man who sold the land into the river. Good on her. The government stepped in. In 1870, the native minister, Donald Maclean, urged Rangatira to allow gold extraction in Ohinimuri, saying, What good do you derive from the gold underground, which neither you nor your ancestors ever dreamed of? Let your relatives derive benefit from the treasures which lie hidden in their land. But a high-ranking chief, Tehira Te Tuiri, the brother of Mere Kuru Te Kati, still refused, saying, There is evil in Hauraki. Of what use is the land after it is broken? When the land is broken, the owner perishes. Eventually, the government had its way, and the Coromandel was opened up to mining. It turned out there was plenty of gold, but virtually all of it was locked up in rock and could only be extracted using massive stamping batteries. That made mining settlements in what's now Thames pretty unpleasant, as Stephen Aldred Grigg notes. The field was deafening. 693 stampers were pounding away. The rock was crushed around the clock, night and day. Smokestacks bounced black soot into the sky. And if you're thinking, it can't have been that bad, listen to the sound just one makes, let alone 693. This heavy equipment was expensive, which meant Coromandel mining was quickly dominated by corporations rather than plucky individuals or informal partnerships. Increasingly, gold diggers gave up on looking for gold themselves, and many worked for these companies for wages. But they didn't lose the pioneers' bolshy attitude. Miners played a central role in the early labour movement. They formed some of our first unions and participated in some of the most famous strikes, like the 1908 Black Ball Coal Miners' Strike and the 1912 Waihi Gold Miners' Strike. The Waihi dispute lasted eight months and became increasingly violent. Armed non-union workers, police and strikers fought at the miners' hall, leaving unionist Fred Evans dead. By the late 19th century, the New Zealand gold rush was over, but it utterly transformed Aotearoa. In just a couple of decades, it helped turn what had been a small, isolated colony of the British Empire into a relatively large and prosperous one. Many of Dunedin's oldest and grandest buildings were built with money from the gold rush. Mining is still a big part of the Otago, West Coast and Coromandel economies. Politically, those hordes of rowdy diggers helped shift the balance of power away from aristocratic sheep barons towards the working class, solidifying some of the egalitarian ideals in New Zealand's national identity. 
they also changed the physical landscape. There are old ruins of stamping batteries in Coromandel, and Chinese miners huts in Arrowtown. There are scars from old water races and piles of tailings from mining in many parts of the South Island. And many Pākehā can trace their first ancestors to those thousands who came here in that wild hunt for gold, including me. Thanks so much for watching our show. Hey kuna. Kia ora, thanks for watching our show. If you want to know more about the gold rush, we've put links to some of the sources we use in the description below. One we found particularly helpful was Diggers, Hatters and Whores by Stephen Aldred Grigg. See you next episode.